Hello, so my name is Thomas Boutrou, um, uh, an independent cute expert uh, from France. Um, I just want to ask you a few questions about, before I'm starting. Uh, how many people were there two years ago for a similar talk? Okay, so nobody. One person. Okay. So a more general question, how many people are using C++ and QML in the same application? Most of you, else you wouldn't be there, I suppose. So, um, I think the base purpose of Qt is to simplify uh, application development. Uh, you have, out of the box, uh, platform abstraction, nice classes for containers, graphics, network, um, I.O., multimedia, and everything else. You will soon have virtual reality, speech recognition, and many, many topics. So if you have seen all the other talks on this uh, summit, you know that Qt is huge. But there are some tasks that you have to do, whatever, what, whatever kind of application you are doing, you still have to some boring tasks to do. And when I'm talking about boring time, uh, task, I'm talking about, um, for example, having to create all the boilerplate code for the mock. I'm not saying that the mock is bad, we need it, but we have a lot of macros to place, and we have a lot of um, code repetition uh, in our code base for the properties, for the slots, for also the models. We have to subclass uh, QAP surface model again and again and again. And we have a lot of work, finally, that isn't uh, super interesting, that is not useful, that is not producing any value, but we need to do it because else our application could not simply uh, compile. So what I'm trying to present to you today is <clears throat> some uh, various techniques uh, that I have developed over the years. I'm coding with Qt since more than 10 years, and I, have, uh, I hate to do something uh, repeatedly. So uh, some ways to code easier, to debug easier, and to maintain your code easier. You can also forget all you, un you, all you have heard about how QML isn't a clean language. You can code cl cleanly with QML, that's false, but that's mainly true in general, but, but that's false, in fact. And I will try to explain how you can avoid, reduce at least code repetition, uh, when you can also reduce your code complexity, that means if the code is the same count of line, at least this line was be, will be simpler. Uh, you, you can do more, less errors in these lines. And also, all the techniques that I will show must at least preserve or even uh, improve the performance. I mean, all the techniques that I will show will not uh, uh, low down your performance and uh, uh, have your frame rate divided by two. There's no risk about this. The, these, these are mainly transparent uh, techniques. So for the topics, I have chose to uh, showcase uh, some non-trivial uh, Qt application. What I mean by non-trivial is, is that not uh, simply a small mobile app that just display one page and gather some information from a web service or some, I mean, toy app that is using only uh, a few lines of C++ and some hundred lines of QML. No, that's a big application. Uh, thousands of lines of QML, thousands of lines of, of C++, and many, many more uh, if I don't use my uh, code generation techniques. But uh, I will just show you an application, and after I will have shown you this application, I will tell you how many time it's spent to, to create, and you will be surprised. I will talk about um, architecture decisions. So how to create your application structure from the start to avoid losing time after. Uh, having uh, some facilities to prototype very quickly, some, something to show to your customer, and after the customer says, okay, I want this, then you can implement the core really easily without having to rewrite everything because the previous one was just a prototype, you know. We'll have the classical bad and good practice section but maybe that's not the ones that you often hear about. 
and then we will have some question and answer session. I hope that this session will be, will be quite long because uh, I hope to exchange with you more than just explain some things that are quite generic, even if a few are very specific. So I will show you an application with a lot of MVC data models. When I say a lot, it's really a lot. That's more than 50 models. Uh, you have dynamics delegates, so delegates are uh, adapted to the content of the model. Uh, you also have completely different kind of controls inside the same model, uh, according to some properties. We use also a very complex configuration and scripting system, so QML will be leveraged to to be more than just UI, you know, and also a lot of custom UI controls and uh, styling option. So. This is the application. I will use a uh, day mode because it lacks contrast. So basically, this is an application that um, that I developed uh, almost a year ago. Uh, its purpose is to simulate uh, an electrical machine with sensors and CAN communication, CAN bus. It's for industry, and uh, it's supposed to simulate the behavior of the uh, natural machine. And it can send, uh, it can create and send can, can frames. So we can test our software, basically Qt software, without having the physical machine. So that's very practical. So I'm just going to load uh, my sample definition, which is a very basic and non-functional non machine, but just to showcase the behavior. So uh, we have some views. We have on the left the sensor list, we have on the right the actuator list, so that's mainly motors and things that move inside the machine. At the center we have the electrical view with the um, analog and digital inputs and outputs, so those from you who works in the industrial field will be familiar with those terms. And the others, that that's not a problem if you don't uh, know what it is exactly. At the bottom you have uh, CAN buses and serial buses, uh, and you have a lot of views and you have some view with uh, debuggable variables. You have some 3D with the physical representation of the machine, and you have a um, virtual dashboard with some controls. This one is completely non-functional. That's just to showcase uh, the controls that exist. You have an oscilloscope. Uh, so what I would like to show is that just I, I won't do a complete demo of the application. There is no point uh, on this, I, I suppose. But just to show you that uh, the application is quite complex. Still, it has a very simple code. I mean, in the code, you will see almost nothing boilerplate. That's only purely uh, functional code, uh, what I call intelligence. That's what um, what is the, our business. The job of my customer is doing machines. My job is to simulate those machines. I don't want to care about all the, the stuff that comes with this uh, because I'm coding. I try to code correctly, so I have to follow the MVC pattern, I have to uh, create properties and create encapsulations, setters, getters, signals, and all of these adds code again and again. So I want to create my application and focus on the intelligence rather than on the implementation details. Uh, so I'm conscient that, uh, I'm aware that all the technique that I will show will be completely useless uh, in some years when Hubsutter will have uh, its proposal for meta classes merge inside the C++ standard, but that's not tomorrow. That's not in one year or five years. That will be maybe more. So during this time, we'll have to rely on some maybe less beautiful techniques, but time-saving techniques. So the application is quite complex, and if I um, just move some joysticks, I will have my machine moving, hopefully. <laughs> And it won't because I didn't activate uh, security. So it's supposed to to move around. But uh, I have some uh, technique bits that I have to activate so the machine can move. But anyway, you can see that the application is quite quite complex. There are there are a lot of views, a lot of modes, uh, a lot of controls on the screen. We have logs, we have printing, we have export and import. Um, so. Maybe someone can tell me how much time one person developed this application. Approximately. Yes. Two years? No. <laughs> I hope not. 
Less, less, less. Watch this. Couple of weeks. That's uh, yeah. We are getting closer. In fact, this application was developed. Uh, yeah. Uh, I mean, the framework was already existing because I developed uh, over other application and just reused it, uh, a lot of techniques. I mean, I just created the whole interface and models and intelligence in 10 days. 10 days and I had a few weeks of testing with the customer so he can give me feedback so I can adjust some delegates on the interface, maybe fix some bugs, but no major change was done after this 10 days. One person, 10 days. So, how is it possible? That's just because we have, I have taken some very important decision from the start of the project. I will use not object-oriented programming, but data-oriented programming. I will tell the difference uh, later. Also, I have pushed the don't repeat yourself rule, but a bit further, maybe too far, too further, maybe, because I, I, I'm very, very, very strict about not repeating myself in the code. And also, I am trying to explode QML at most. So just don't just use it for cute quick, but you can use it for a lot more things. And I will show you some nice things if, if we have enough time. And so we just speak about them. So just before I got deeper inside the data-oriented programming paradigm. I just want to do some uh, reminder about declarative coding. What is declarative coding in QML? Because there are a lot of other declarative language, but they have not the same abilities as QML. First, it's a descriptive state of objects inside the hierarchy. So QML is visually looks like a tree. And each object have a state that is described by these properties. So the visual uh, feedback of its state is the, the property set of an object. We can have also in QML dynamic relation between these objects. Uh, the other declarative languages out there don't have this meaning of relation. You can just declare some structure, for example, HTML or CSS. But QML does have a very good uh, system of object to object relation. And we have ways to watch changes. So more than just declarative coding, it's also um, event-driven uh, event uh, coding. So now we can talk a, lot, a little more about data-oriented uh, programming. So for me, in my opinion, uh, beyond the simple uh, class method uh, uh, consideration, I mean an object is just finally an input-output of data. An object is meant to process data. In fact, a computer is meant to process data. And an object is just an input, output of data. And all the rest is just plumbing. So if the data is persistent, we can use a property. Property can be read or and written. So we can just make it read only or read write. So we can have it as an input and output or only as an input. Um, if the data is provided temporarily, so it has no meaning if it stays pers persistently inside the, the object, you can use uh, a method with arguments. And if the data is produced temporarily, so it will have no meaning outside the moment it's produced, just use a signal with arguments, or maybe the return value of your function. So that's for the generic part. Your object contains value, you have outputs, out inputs. So you can input a property by modifying it. You can input also function code with arguments. And you can, in the output, have some change for notification of a property. Or you can have some signal uh, that tells you, OK, something happened inside it. And what is very important to understand is that you can have multiple combination. For example, a function call can perfectly emit a signal and also change some properties. And the same goes uh, the other way. If you change some property, you can also have, for obviously, the, the, the notifier that this property has changed, but you can also have other events happening because somewhere the property has reached some special value. It, it has triggered some internal stuff and is triggering events. So that's very important to see your object like a black box that processes data. 
Now, we see that the object is just a block that processes data, and QML is the perfect tool to manage these blocks and connect them together. The QML syntax by itself is perfectly represented as a tree. Visually, the object has are um, nested. Um, we also have bindings, which are some property to property connection type. And it, they will watch the properties. So if something changes, if there is some notifier or events, your stuff will be updated accordingly. And you also have the signal handlers, which are signal slot connections, just like in C++, but they are implicit. <coughs> it's very important when you code in a QML, but not just in QML, so it's not a trivial application, you have C++, and if you want your C++ to integrate nicely with your QML, you have to um, respect those rules uh, also in the, in the C++ side. So when you are coding in C++, always remember that your object will be seen as QML, just like a black box that processes data, and your properties, signals, and slots will just be inputs and outputs for data. And then you will have a very nice API, very convenient to use in QML. So avoid using properties for temporary values. I have seen some projects where uh, people were using only properties everywhere because you know it's QML, so you use properties. But if your property has no meaning, uh, if its lifetime is reduced uh, and the value stays in the object, it has no meaning and that's a bad cod coding pattern. You have to use either a property uh, uh, function call or signal, but don't use property for temporaries. Also, don't use uh, signal arguments to pass data uh, because um, that's if, if you if you are creating, for example, an object, um, I don't have some practical example, but there are some objects that are producing values, and the values are changing very often. And if the value is only provided inside the arguments of the signal, the only way to access it is inside the signal handler, so in JavaScript. And in QML, you will maybe be happy to, to watch your, the property state, uh, if you put it in the property instead of the signal, so that you can maybe show it visually or have some bindings relying on, on it. And anyway, if you have a property, you have a signal. So if your value needs to be accessed outside the signal handler, don't put it inside the signal argument. And also, when you are using QML, uh, always remember to split your object into maybe smaller objects. Don't hesitate to use sub-objects and don't do very big classes with a lot of stuff in it because that's hardly reusable in QML. Just look at, the, for example, the item, the QuickQuick item. It has uh, a sub-object for anchors, another one for uh, the layers, so you can, you can customize uh, the OpenGL part. The text item has a font sub-object. The rectangle ob uh, object has a grad uh, gradient and border sub-object. So use very small objects which are specialized uh, for just one type of data to process and just nest them. You can create properties which are uh, sub-object types. So you, you can just integrate like you want in QML. So that's just a small example. Okay, I think a GMI is. Uh... Okay. I don't know what is going on. It's perfectly clear on the screen. So, the next step, once these very theoretical um, hints are given, is to, to know in practice how you can apply them. So, we have to avoid repeating ourselves. So, in QML, that's quite easy. You can create custom components. Uh, that's completely implicit in the language. You can just create another file with an uppercase first letter, and it's a new component. So that's very handy. Uh, you can also use and abuse uh, repeaters and MVC. Uh, you can create uh, repeaters for almost everything in QML. And you can also uh, try to use extensions from C++, because sometimes you are trying to do something purely in QML and JavaScript, and it will take a lot less line of code to create it in C++. And I don't even talk about the performance issues. 
So for example, the attached objects, I don't know how many of you have used, uh, have created custom attached objects. Not that much. Attached objects are very, uh, I've, seen, I've seen them really, uh, really used. Um, they are very practical to add some optional API to any type of object inside QML. For example, if you want to, uh, an object to document something because in your interface you want to display some, you know, some help panels for the users and you want to put them on any object, you can just create some object, uh, I mean, help. Okay, call it help with uh, some content property string, and you can put it on any object. So you can put it put it on a standard object like item, rectangle, any object from QML. You don't have to change their API, and you can provide uh, additional features to this object. So that's very very practical, and in fact, people are not using attached objects very much. In C++, uh, I'm not going to do a, um, a course about C++. You, you are supposed to know C++. Just a, a quick reminder, you can avoid repeating yourself using function classics, uh, classes, so the, the basic uh, oriented programming stuff. You can use templates. Uh, be very uh, aware that templates are hard to debug, but still they are very useful, so use them when you can. Macros. That's uh, some controversial subject because macros are supposed to be bad because they can do very weird things. They are hard to control. But in my opinion, um, using a macro, a nicely de designed macro is still better than doing copy and paste. And also the meta object, uh, that's also uh, some some part of Q that is not used. I mean, you use it because you use signal and slot, but you are maybe not using it as much as you could, because you can take a lot of interesting information in the meta object. And anyway, QML is using Qt, so it relies on the meta object, so why not use it a little more? So in QML, you can create custom components. Uh, of course, you are creating your components when you are creating, for example, a button or a text field or anything. But do you know that, for example, a very simpler styling system than CSS is for HTML? For example, if you have two texts, oh, that's still. Okay, oh, that's the cable. That's the issue with the mini HDMI converter. It doesn't hold in place very well. Ah, okay, it's back. So, oh, that's what's happening. What? If you can, oh, oops. You just leave it in this mode and show it because then it's like this. Yeah. Okay. So let's say, for example, you have different text items in your application and they are styled differently because one is a title, the other one is some subtitle, some uh, error message. So I have just a few examples there. You can see that there are uh, some particular uh, values for all of these. You have the size, you have the color, the font, the, the weight, etc. So instead of um, repeating over and over again that you are using this or this style, you can just create different subclasses. Oh, that's very annoying, this stuff. Okay. You can just create some different uh, QML components and just in your code use a different subclass. This way, anyway, when you are using QML, you are forced to, to put the object type when you instantiate it. So why not just put more information inside object type and that makes your code clearer. What is going on? Okay. Also, we can subclass components in QML to add semantic discrimination. What I call semantic discrimination is that you have a very few base classes in QML. You have item, rectangle, text, uh, image, and a few more. But that you are using those to create more complex objects. 
And sometimes in your code, you end up having rectangle, 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 and you don't know what it means. So if you have a lot of different ways of using the same base component in QML, why not just put them inside components, even if they are not very different from each other, just they have a different meaning in your interface. One is a background, the other one is a, a line, a separator, uh, something else. This way, when you are using them inside your code, you have different objects, so that's very easy to customize them, like we've seen before, but that's also, when you, re you read your code, you can easily uh, grasp what each object is doing. The repeater is a very nice way in QML to uh, simplify your code because you can factorize the data, uh, the instance, by the data. What I mean is that uh, factorized by the data is, for example, if you take those three texts, the differences are the, the text value and the color. So why not put them inside the model, a static one, because I don't need change on this one, and use the delegates so I can reduce the code. Those are very basic uh, example, but still I think it's, it's, it's uh, useful to, to remind them. So we come to the attach object. Uh, I have one example that I have put in my library, graphical library. Uh, for example, anchors. These are very, very uh, verbose. Uh, they are very practical, but they are very verbose. So for example, if we take anchors, uh, you are very often doing anchor left, parent left, anchor right, parent right, or like the other example. So we have repetition of parent everywhere. We also have repetition of the anchor line. So that's wanted because you could perfectly do anchor left, parent right. But that's, what, that's not what you are doing most of the time. So why not simplify those cases by creating additional anchors for the usual cases that you are using very often. You want to fill the parent vertically or uh, horizontally. You want to uh, occupy the left side or upper side or lower side. So I have created extra anchors. I'm taking just one time the object that I want to anchor on and the type of anchor. So I'm replacing two or three or, or four maybe line of code with just one and that's clearer because when you read the code, you don't have to read each anchor to, to know where, where the problem uh, for the layout could, uh, could be. So if you want to have the implementation of this, uh, this object, because it's not uh, mainline at the moment, you could look at the Qt Kreml tricks UI elements. Uh, the link for the GitLab is on the last slide. So we come to some basic or more advanced techniques in C++. You can, like you know, use classes and structures to group methods with the data which are the, they are related to. You can use polymorphism to have some generic interface that you can use in QML and have different implementation on the C++ side. You could also use templates. That's quite hard to mix with the mock, but still you can do it. Um, you can use a template specialization uh, to handle some specific cases. So you can have one general, uh, maybe the, the 19 general percent uh, cases you can handle with a template and have some specialization for the word case. You can replace most of your macros with just inline function because very much, uh, a lot of people are using macros just to create some, you know, min, max, or something like this. So you can easily replace them with inline functions. And you can use also constants inside class or inside enums to replace your define some name and number because that's a very bad way to create constants. Still, macros, they are not that good. But if they are used correctly, they can be very helpful because that's still better, like I said before, than using just copy and paste over and over again. For example, my best example is the property declaration because you have to create yourself a getter, a sitter, a signal, a data member, and create the property macro with all that stuff in it because else you can't access it in QML. So someone will tell me maybe, yes, you can use property member but property member, you still have to create your member, you still have to create your signal, and if you want to use it on the C++ side, that's quite ugly because you are accessing directly the member. So if you want to use it from another class, you will have to put your member in public, for example, and you have to trigger the signal yourself. So that's, that's very ugly. 
The other way would be to just create the Q property inside your code and use script creator to generate the missing code for you. But that's what I call, I call it code pollution. For me, it's, it's noise. Uh, you have uh, some header file and you have tens and tens and tens of lines that are pretty much useless because you know what a property is supposed to be. You know that it's supposed to have a getter, a setter, a type, a name, a notifier, but you still see tens of code, uh, a line of code on your, on your, your header. And in the C++ file, that's weird. You, that's, that's worse. You can have maybe five lines of code for a setter because you have to check the value and you have to, to assign it to emit the signal. So, I think the, bit, the best solution is to create macros. These ones are in the side the super macro submodule of my Qt Crystal library. Um, basically, they just take the common components of, of all the stuff that we typed before. That's basically the name and the type, and all the rest is just uh, generated by the macro. So the only difference is that from the QML side, a, a property can be read-write, read-only, read or constant. So we have three different variants of the same macro. And we can perfectly, uh, if you want to add feature, for example, if you want that your uh, setter returns a Boolean telling if your uh, setter has actually changed something or not, that can be useful on the C++ side. You can perfectly just change inside the macro and it will be propagated everywhere. You can also create your deep, uh, new, new variant of this macro. For example, you can imagine a QML config property. Instead of uh, changing some data member, it could just uh, set value and get value from a Q setting class and just use the name of the property to, to match the name of the, pro, uh, the, the settings key. So you, there are endless possibilities for this. Also remember that mock can be your friend. It's just a, it's not just um, an annoying extra build step that you know you have to mock before compiling. Um, you can use the meta object, for example, to translate an name an value to text. So that's practical for debug. That's also practical for um, if you want to serialize something because that's quite uh, a bad idea to, for example, if you want your application to communicate with another using JSON. It's a bad idea to transfer your enums like uh, numbers because an enum can be reordered at any time and the number will change. So you would prefer to use the meta object to map the enum value to enum key, send the enum key on the network, and maybe the other application can do the match uh, in the other side and get back the value. Another example could be to look up slot and signals to do some auto-connect. Uh, I think the Qt designer was doing it at some point, uh, auto-connecting some signals from buttons to the C++ side, but you could use it for other stuff. Imagine you provide some objects to some class, and the class can look into the object and see, oh, there is this method, it, it has this name, something, and it can connect it to my own uh, implementation. So you can have some generic stuff. You can also introspect an object to import export, so that's just basic serialization. And you can extract, using all these steps, uh, these, these steps, you can extract properties to integrate into a model. So I have an example in my library, the smart data models. I have uh, something that I presented two years ago. Uh, just take some arbitrary QObject derived class and you can create a model from it. You, have, you don't have to subclass a uh, QAbstract list model. <coughs> and also remember that QML is more than just cute quick. QML can be used for uh, configuration and scripting because it's declarative and also um, you can have some imperative code. So you can do very large scope of things with, with QML. For example, uh, in fact, it's just uh, a tree of QObject. It's strongly typed. That's uh, JavaScript that is not typed, but properties in QML are typed. Uh, you have relation between objects. You, it's easy to factorize. You can create sub subcomponents uh, and you use MVC, and it can contain a certain level of logic. I, I, I use the terms certain because um, I'm talking about logic, about some decision that can be taken inside the QML before redirecting to C++ for the real uh, stuff. Don't do your full algorithm in QML. The limitation of QML is that it's not easy at all, almost impossible to modify it programmatically. 
you can use XML or JSON from the C++ and change the values and have the file uh, updated on the disk, but you can't do this with QML because the syntax is so complex and so flexible. There are, at the moment, no way to change a QML file from the C++. From the C++. And also, the syntax can get very messy if you abuse it. So for example, if you use a lot of JS and you are tricking the prototype and some things, you can have some very nasty things in the, in the syntax. But if you keep your QML clean and you don't need to modify it from C++, that's a very good tool from, uh, for extending your application. Use it like a, some maybe some plugin system. So that's quite quite cool. Current example in the market, uh, you have cubes. That's maybe the most uh, widely known example. It's using QML syntax, but not for doing graphics, just to manage your uh, project architecture. You can create your rules and uh, your group of files and your sub projects inside cubes. Uh, also, the project that I show uh, is part of a Qt can project, and I'm also using QML to describe a can open uh, object dictionary. So those of you who are using the can open know that the object dictionary can be quite verbose when using a um, any or XML file. In QML, that's quite compact and readable. Uh, the test bench, the application that I've shown uh, at, at start, is using QML to describe uh, the machine. So the test bench is just providing uh, the objects, the sensor, the inputs, outputs, the blocks, and we use the QML uh, format to describe the machine using those blocks. So that's very easy to create a machine and change the, the behavior and integrate a little of logic inside the application. I also had another project. Uh, it was just a toy project to see how far we could go, but I was actually able to generate XML or HTML or SVG or CSS from QML files. So just take some C++ objects with properties. You can fill those properties on the QML side, and on the C++ side, when the object is called somewhere, it can just uh, generate some uh, other declarative languages. That's quite handy if you want to generate code and maybe generate different type of code. You can use the same object to describe uh, the structure. At start, you can use QML. So, last part before the question and answer. Uh, that's the good and bad habits. Because coders, uh, developers can have, like anyone, very bad habits that they have to change, hopefully. So the, I think the, the very, the, the worst habit is the copy and paste. Will it be copy and paste in the same code base or copy and paste from the internet to your code base? Uh, that's always a bad idea to copy and paste. Uh, in fact, you can look at the blog post of uh, PVS Studio, which are uh, editors of a static uh, analyzer. Uh, most of the errors that they find when they run the analyzer on the code are caused by typos. And those typos are, are caused by copy and paste most of the time. Also, if you copy and paste the same code over and over and over again, you will have to fix it over and over and over again. And in fact, your code, just like for the setters and getters on your properties, your code is cluttered, polluted by what I call it noise. That's some code that is not really useful because you have it all over the place. So your real logic uh, something that is very specific to a particular place of the code will be uh, flooded by all the surrounding code that is repeated over and over again. Also, you have to remember that a board developer will not clean his code afterwards. I mean, if he doesn't do it um, regularly, it will not do it uh, maybe two, in two years when the project will be ended, or maybe I will have time to clean my code. Nope. He won't do it anyway. So the code will stay like this, and we will have to put uh, someone to work on it again, we have to maybe restart from scratch. And also, that's not always true, but uh, most of the time, when you have copy and paste, it can hurt performance, at least on QML side, because QML uh, is uh, relying on, um, you have uh, some loading time, compile time, generation time on the GIT, and the bigger the file is, the longer it takes to build. Maybe after it's built, it will be optimized, because they will see that there are some repetition, but the loading time will be bigger. And there are also the case of implicit components. Does anyone know what implicit components in QML are? Okay, a few person. Implicit component is just in QML. Anytime you customize 
a standard object. For example, you take, you take a rectangle and you want to make it a square. So you just create a property that you name size, it's an int, and you use it for uh, width and height. If you are doing this code maybe five times, you have five implicit components. You will have five rectangle underscore uh, QML type underscore some number, which have the same content because they have the same property customization, but still in the QML cache, they, these are five different component metadata. So if you want to merge these files, those five components into one, you have to name explicitly your component, you move it into a separate file, and then you have in, in the QML cache of metadata, you have one component, name maybe square instead of rectangle. That's some, something that mostly, most people don't know about, but if you are using custom properties, custom signals, or custom functions inside an object, you are implicitly subclassing it. But for the QML side, uh, in the engine, internally, that's explicitly some different component. So try to, uh, if, when, you, when you are doing some customization on a type, if you are doing more than once subclass, systematically. The next very bad habit is the magic values. And I think it's, uh, it's, it's worse in QML than in C++. I will explain myself. For example, if you are, uh, if you have made some mistake in QML, you are passing some ints using maybe 42, 13. You, are, you have real numbers inside your code and you pass them on the C++ side. It will be very hard to find in your code where you are passing the wrong value because the, the value in itself means nothing inside the context of where it's used in the C++ side. And on the QML side, you have no clue of what is going on on the C++ side. So you, you can't know if your value is correct or not. Uh, also, um, the, so what, what, keep, what could be interesting is that if the, the constant is purely graphical, you can use a QML singleton, some read-only property in it, so you can have a name for your number. If it's, share, if it's shared with the C++, you can use a C++ constant property inside an object or use an enum. Enum are quite practical for this. And also, that's not a number, that's a boolean, but we have the same problem. Avoid on the QML side having uh, to use a, a C++ function with multiple Boolean arguments. Because on, this, on, the, on the QML side, we will have my function true, comma, false, comma, false, comma, true, and you don't know what that means. And because calling functions on QML is done in JavaScript, if you have some mistake, you are mistyping something, or you are forgetting one argument, you don't even know what is going on on the C++ side, because you will have maybe one argument that is undefined, and it will be converted implicitly to false, and you don't know. In, in C++, if you want to change the number of your arguments, you can use some refactoring tools, for example, Clang, uh, to propagate your change on your code, but on QML you can't, and you have no connection between the QML uh, syntax, uh, the code, comp code model and the C++ code model. So if you change the argument count in the C++, it won't be propagated in the QML. So you will have maybe silent errors, maybe not silent error, but if you have silent errors, they are the, the worst because you can't find them until you encounter them. So what I will recommend, just create one class for each enum, for different reasons, put a Q gadget and Q enum inside it, so you can have in the QML and C++, uh, you will have the same syntax for the, the enums, we'll have class dot enum in QML or uh, colon colon on C++, and instead of using booleans, use enums, if, even if your enum only contain two values, that's still uh, more understandable than uh, using booleans. I would really recommend that you never use booleans on your C++ interfaces, that are exposed to QML, unless it's a property, it's, it's a name property, there is no issue with name property which are Boolean, but function like arguments that's quite complicated, except if uh, your function only has one argument and the name of the, the function is explicit, for example, set visible, true, false, that's, that's correct. The third is the responsibility. You have to divide through, you have to encapsulate, you have learned it a long time ago on the C++, you have to cre create private members and use public getters and setters. You have to use the same uh, uh, kind of separation on the QML. Uh, so the huge objects are hard to find and uh, to debug and to test, so you have to split them. You divide them into some uh, slower, uh, smaller objects, so we can test them individually and every object has its own responsibility, its own encapsulation level, and you can uh, choose if you use uh, any level of 
abstraction. And JavaScript is not suited to, for big, big logic, so you use uh, C++ for this. That's the responsibility of C++ anyway to implement your intelligence, your business. Don't try to do your business in JavaScript. JavaScript is just good to do unclicked if some flag is to some status. Maybe I call this function or this other one, but that's, that's all. Don't try to implement algorithm in, in JavaScript. And consider when you create an application that JavaScript and uh, QML are public. For, you can have any private stuff in QML or JavaScript and unsafe also for the JavaScript part, it's not uh, strongly typed. <coughs> so you don't want um, too much things to be exposed from the C++ to the QML because uh, if something goes wrong inside your JavaScript, you will have very hard time to debug this part. So you want also to hide some things inside the C++ side. So use wisely the read-only properties. Maybe you don't want your, the setter to be accessible to QML. Maybe some part of your API must stay outside the mock because everything that is visible to the mock is visible to QML. So if you have a class that is exposed to QML, maybe some of the function needs to not be a slot so that you can risk to use them in JavaScript. Also, keep the external stuff external. So avoid coupling your objects uh, too tightly with each other. If you went to the uh, Boterson uh, talk a moment ago, he was talking about a Q object uh, deep dive, and he, he told that slot and signals were, um, were designed to allow to create objects like black boxes. You don't have that object A knows about object B and connects directly to it. You have to, to, to put the, the responsibility of the connection to an upper object in this case, the QML engine, because you are instantiating objects, in both object A and B in the same engine, and you use QML engine to connect with bindings. But don't make your object A aware of your object B directly, and also if you have a circular dependency, that's horrible to debug. So your object must, must be able to uh, have all their, their needed data inside them, be self-contained, and don't care about what is going on outside them. If you can have maybe some exception, if an object must use another object, then provide this object as a writable pointer property in the first object. So on the QML side, you will just bind the ID of the other object inside the first one, and you will know about it. But avoid using this too often because that's quite rigid uh, architecture. Also, uh, hard coupling is also a not completely different uh, issue of, co <coughs> of coupling. <laughs> I have seen a lot of person uh, using anchors on the root object of their components in QML. The issue is that if you want to use your component out in another place in your application, maybe you don't want the same anchors and it's quite difficult to erase the anchors that are on the root object of the component. So the component would have at its root object uh, some implicit size, but no anchor, and you always change the anchors when you instantiate your object in the page. Because you, I, I have used, uh, I have helped a colleague to debug some weird layout uh, issues, and they were almost always caused by the fact that the root object didn't have some proper implicit side and had some anchors, so it would break the layout if you put it inside a row, column, or something else. Also, for the same reason, don't use model, model data, or index inside your component if the component is a delegate, if you have moved the delegate into a separate file, that means that you are using external scope resolution to access model and model data and index. Don't do it. Those values are only valid inside the scope of the repeater, so just use a property. Yes, I would. Just use a property inside your delegate to be able to pass those values to your delegate, and inside the, f the separate file, just use your properties. Yes? Yeah, that, that, that's true, and that's why I developed my object-based model. I have the ability to take some special role that is named cute object, and it gives me the underlying object instance, so I could perfectly just put this object inside the delegate, and it, it has all the properties inside. 
So if your delegate is self-contained, it can fill into five, ten lines of code, and you don't separate it inside the, the file. You can use model dot role inside the repeater, but if you move it into a separate file, that could be more interesting to just pass it the cute object and use the cute object in your separate file. And you gain the fact that it's uh, property safe, uh, type, type safe, and also you will have uh, auto completion, so that's nice because your object is known by cute, so you can type my object dot and you will have two, all your properties uh, completed, so that, in my opinion, much comfortable. But yes, if you are using another model that doesn't have this ability, you will have to pass all the interesting values to your delegate. But most of the time, you can have models that have a lot of properties, a lot of roles, and you are not, you are not using all of them inside every delegate because you can have different delegates on the same model. So you pass just the one that are, you are interested to, and, but you pass them uh, explicitly. You avoid using external scope resolution because if we manage to get the strict mode integrated inside the QML engine, it, won't, it wouldn't work anyway anymore. So you, you, you have to, to change your code if you update Qt. So anyway, I think it's a good idea to, to change it from now. Also, uh, you, in the other way, you have to expose stuff uh, in your object interface to avoid using external scope re re evaluation. So that, that is valid for model and model data, but also if you need some any other value or object that are in the instantiation scope, but you are using a separate file, just create type, type property inside your object and uh, just bind the values uh, when you instantiate it. I know that it can, it can add a lot of line of code, but that's the only way to, clear, to create a clean, self-contained, reusable component. And also, last but not least, never, never, never let the C++ code dig into QML. Uh, I know that you can use find child, find children, uh, you can use uh, some stuff inherited from QWidget to get the C++, find the pointer of some object inside your uh, object tree, so you can directly change it from the C++ side, but that's, that's breaking the complete encapsulation pattern, the complete MVC pattern, and you, you never know from the C++ side what you are going to do if you change your object directly. If you, to, if you need to change something, just put it in some model or some state or some property and just bind on it on QML. That's simpler, that's cleaner, and that's the way to do it. And the last one, laziness. Yeah, you see exactly what I mean. Laziness is maybe the biggest uh, issue with developers. In fact, Big Gates said that a good developer is a lazy developer because it will find a way to do less. But that doesn't mean you have to, to find a way to do less in the bad way. You have to, do, to find a way to always do less in an efficient way, in a good way. So don't use fake models for MVC, just use a real model, if you, have, if you are too lazy to create a model, that's my case, you can use the QML object list model that's made for this. You create just a class and you can create model from, from it. Uh, also, if you don't want to create your own objects, your visual object, but the, the, all made, uh, the already made one are too complex, too heavy, too hard to customize, just create yours because you will take less time to create yours than to, to use an overly complicated one to just use a small part of it. And once you have done your, your object, you can reuse them. So that's not lost time. Do not use JavaScript for algorithm because you say, ah, it's too hard to do in C++, maybe I will do it in, in JavaScript and maybe after I will put it in C++. You won't do it. So create it directly in C++ at first time. Also, Mind the C++ warning as the, as if the, there was errors. So now in Qt Creator 5.5, uh, 4.4, you have, uh, uh, some nice hints on the margin about, uh, Clang code model. So treat them like the, if they were, uh, errors because most of them are, are right. <laughs> most, most of the time, Clang is right and you are wrong. There are a few cases where he's wrong, but that's very, very, very rare. <laughs> And also the QML warnings, they are worse because QML doesn't have compilation time checks. So you have to treat every message that you see in the, in the output at runtime like if it was a, a compilation error. Because that's the only way to ensure that your QML is correct. So if you have something telling about a binding loop, telling about uh, some type error, or some, some undefined reference, something, just focus on it and debug it like, like if it was uh, some uh, 
error that prevents you to compile because that's the only way to ensure that your code is roughly correct. And also, like I said before, refactor and cleanup on the go. Don't plan it on the to-do list at the very end. When I'm finished, when I'm done, uh, maybe I will clean because you won't do it and the code will stay as it is. So feel free to debate. Uh, I have the link for the for the GitLab project with all the, the macros, models, templates, uh, QML components uh, that you could reuse freely. That's completely open source. Um, the license is uh, like a WTFPL, so you can do whatever you want. I don't care if you use for commercial or open source, GPL, LGPL, MIT. You do like you want. Uh, if you want to, uh, to enhance them with me, you want to contribute, feel free to do it. If you don't want, that's not a problem. Uh, all I w those things were really useful to me to be able to develop big application in a very small time and focus on my business instead of nasty tricks. So if you want to use them, uh, open bar. So anyone has a question or, or doesn't agree with what I said? Perhaps Maybe one. Perhaps. Question. Yeah. Perhaps oh, we do it this way. If you uh, if you have questions, you you talk to him afterwards yeah. because we are running out of time already. So we already exceeded it. Please rate the presentation. This one in the uh, Qt World Summit app, which you have installed on your smartphone, as well as all the others. So after the presentation is done, you can always rate it. It would be very good uh, feedback for us. Thank you and.